Hi, my name is Brett Allison. I'm a performance consultant and director of technical services at IntelliMagic. Today I'm going to talk about a better way to buy, implement, and manage the performance of disk storage for SAN and mainframe. What are the IntelliMagic Availability Intelligence Solutions? Well, IntelliMagic Vision is our flagship product. It comes in several flavors for different product support. It comes in ZOS, ZOS Disk, ZOS Tape, and SAN flavors. And its goal is to protect availability and avoid performance problems with automated visibility inside your storage infrastructure. IntelliMagic Direction is designed to model the performance of your workloads on specific storage hardware configurations. The objectives for today are to make sure there's an understanding of what availability intelligence is. We'll also talk about storage performance modeling concepts and how they apply to storage management. And then we'll talk about the storage management lifecycle and capacity management, how that builds and plays into the design phase, where I'll provide some examples of design failures, some challenges that are ever present in storage architecture, and best practices for storage architecture. And then we'll go on to talk about the last two phases of the life cycle, which are the build and the run phase. What is availability intelligence? Well, availability is defined by ITIL is the ability of a configuration item or IT service to perform its agreed function when required. Intelligence, as defined by Sun Tzu, is foreknowledge of an adversary. So what makes this powerful is when you combine the two, availability intelligence, which is the automated analysis of performance and configuration data using built-in knowledge about the hardware. What this does is it generates foresight, which allow you to protect availability. In this slide, we'll talk briefly about storage performance modeling concepts. Essentially, the goal of storage performance modeling is to solve the following equation. Configuration information plus workload information equals performance. The following picture is an abstraction of the configuration of a disk storage system. On the front end, you have host adapters, or in some cases called directors. Within the controller, you also have processor resources as well as cache resources. On the back end, you have a device adapter or a disk adapter, or sometimes referred to as a disk director. And then on the back end, you have the connected disk drives. An I.O. workload consists of the following categories, reads, which can be broken down into random reads or sequential reads, random read hits or random read misses. On the other side, we have writes, which can be random or sequential, and the random writes can be random hit, meaning the record that's being updated is already in cache, or random miss, which means the record that is being updated or the track that's being updated is not in cache. Sequential operations have the effect of cache hits because the controllers can do prefetching and read the data into cache before it's required. So these operations tend to have a lower response time than the random operations and require less disk operations. IntelliMagic Direction under the covers is a series of queues and workload input. There are several sections in this diagram. The yellow section represents workload input. The blue sections are the internal components, and the green represents the outputs. To put it simply, the workload comes into the queuing model. There are adapter models, queue time spent at each adapter, and service times spent at each adapter. There are processor models. These are things like the Intel processors or customize ASICs or RISC processors that are embedded into the controllers. These have both a cost for the service time and uh, queue time associated with them. And the drive models, these are things like the speed of the drives influence these, the RPMs would influence these, the seek time. So each of the drive models is a reflection of the drive specifications and capabilities. Ideally, the models are built based on specifications from vendors as well as measured data from workloads in the wild. 
Each of the workloads will have a amount of time that they spent to be serviced and an amount of time that they spent queuing, waiting for the adapter if it's busy, or the processor or the drives. And the sum of the queue and the, the service time, the average queue and the average service time equals the average response time. Externally, we will report the utilizations, which is essentially how busy the different components are. So how busy the adapter, the processor, and the drive configurations. The individual models for adapter, processor, and drive will have individual response times or average response times. And the sum of those things can be accumulated to provide an overall response time. This, in essence, covers the direction product or modeling product at a high level abstraction under the covers. In this section of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the storage management lifecycle. According to ITIL version 3, capacity management is designed as the process responsible for ensuring that the capacity of IT services and the IT infrastructure is able to deliver agreed service level targets in a cost effective and timely manner. As it pertains to the storage management lifecycle, Capacity is required in the design, the build, and the run phases. Oftentimes, in the design and build phases, the architecture and engineers work to design and build a solution that meets the business unit requirements. Once it's turned over to the run phase or the operations team, it is their responsibility to make sure that the system that was designed to meet the SLAs actually does meet the SLAs. And we'll kind of drill down into that as we go through this presentation further. In the storage lifecycle management design phase, the architect works with the business units to determine the user requirements for performance, availability, and cost. And then the architect or engineer specifies workload characteristic requirements and requests the operations team to gather the workload information for any existing workloads. The architect then designs a system or solution that meets the user requirements. And we'll go into these steps in more detail as we move forward in this presentation. In this section of the presentation, I'm going to go over a few examples of design failures. The examples are about back-end disk capacity and under-configuring the back-end. I'm also going to look at a front-end host adapter example, and then a consolidation opportunity. And then also I'm going to look at IBM SVC compression uh, example. All of these things had either some availability impacts or extra spend, and the result was a failure. So we'll, we'll get into more detail as we move forward. In the first case, I'm going to talk about the under-configured backend possibility. We actually encountered this situation a couple different times, and it was similar types of ideas. But in this case, they had 146 gig drives, 100 terabytes of usable capacity, and they were doing 70,000 IOPS. For this configuration and this disk size, you had about 100 different RAID groups. What Each one was about a terabyte, and that equaled... 800 DDMs, so one RAID group, 8 DDMs, RAID, RAID 5, 7 plus P, or 6 plus P plus spare, you have about 800 DDMs total. The average IOPS per spindle was about 100. In order to save some money and reduce cost, the site decided to go with 600 gig drives. Now, the problem with that is it reduced the number of spindles by four. You actually had only 200 DDMs instead of 800, and that meant that you're doing 400 IOPS per spindle. That actually resulted in very high response time compared to what they had with the 146 gig drives, and the result was a performance requirement that was not met, an SLA that was not met, and it also impacted the production because the performance was so bad. So the overall result was a failure even though they were successful in achieving the cost goals. In this case, the front end adapters were under configured. Different host adapters have different performance capabilities. And it's up to the architect or engineer to understand that. But it's not always straightforward. And this was a, one example. In this case, the host adapters had four ports, but they weren't really designed to use all four ports concurrently for scalability. If you used one port, you got the full four gig. If you used the second port, you got an additional about 140 megabytes per second. But the other two ports did not provide you any additional bandwidth on the front end. It was constrained at two ports. What 
ended up happening was that even though they only needed four ports, they really, they had the workload that really needed two host adapters. They ended up having to only use two ports on each host adapter. Now, when we model that kind of a thing, we can actually see that with the workload and we can see if one HA would work or if two are required. Now, most people in production environments would never go with a single host adapter, but sometimes you might want to get away with something like that for maybe a test or a dev environment. In any case, this was a production environment and they were trying to save some money, so they tried to keep the cost low initially by only adding four ports on a single host adapter. What happened was once they loaded it up, the performance was so bad that they had to do an emergency order for an additional host adapter. Initially, the cost was successful in the cost goal was successful in that they kept the cost low initially. The performance requirement was the same as before and they they failed at this because they failed to realize the differences between the host adapter architectures. In terms of availability, there was an impact to the production workload, so this was a failure. And if we look at the overall result, even though we got the cost again, it's it's a failure because our performance and availability requirements were not met. In this case, there was a missed consolidation opportunity. What we did was we looked at two different controllers. As you can see, this is a ZOS SASD response time breakdown where we have the connect time in blue, the disconnect time in red, the pending time in green, and there really wasn't any iOS queue time to speak of. And as you can see in the, the Gen 1 FICON DSS1 and DSS2 instances, the response time was either 3.44 or 3.72 on average. With the new generation, we looked at two different vendors and we looked at a balanced workload split. That meant we put the workload from both controllers onto both of the vendors' platforms, the new generations, and they both worked and they both provided response times that exceeded the previous response time expectations. Fortunately, the, the customer didn't want to do that consolidation. They wanted to do a one-to-one. -one. And so the point is, of this is simply to, to say that when you're moving from an older generation of hardware to a newer generation of hardware, you can often do a two-to-three consolidation. In terms of evaluating whether this was a success or not, in terms of the, the cost structure, it was actually a failure. In terms of performance, they certainly did meet the performance and availability expectations, but my conclusion is that the overall result is a failure. This is actually an example in an IBM SVC environment, particularly for the older CG8s, where I saw quite a few folks run into performance issues when they enabled the free RTC. The main reason was that RTC required more processing resources than they had in the older generation of the hardware under heavily loaded systems. While it was a free feature to enable a, as a trial, in terms of it didn't have software costs for a trial, it did have the effect of immediate performance response time issues because of the overloaded processors. In terms of the initial cost, it was a success because it was free, but the performance requirement that was failed because it was assuming the same as before RTC and it actually had worse performance when they enabled RTC and the availability was also impacted, so the overall result was a failure. This is a case typical of some of the previous cases that I mentioned where modeling would have addressed the risk and validated whether or not it was an appropriate configuration change. In this next section, I'm going to talk about some of the design challenges, and I'm going to go in through these in great detail, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular slide, but I'm going to talk about what, you know, which vendor do you choose, what are the configuration options, what is the lease term, what kind of SSDs and automated tiering do you need, what kind of disaster recovery options should you use or consider, and what if you want to add a new workload, how do you design for that, and what are some things that you should think about when you're writing an RFP. Now, all of this is under the category of design challenges. And in many ways, the job of designing a solution that meets all the performance and availability and user requirements is a very difficult job, and it's very technically challenging, and it requires a new approach. So one of the challenges when designing a system 
is choosing the vendor and the model. Typically, most sites will choose the next generation of their current solution because it's comfortable, it's easy, but every system is designed to run different types of workloads better. And you don't really know which vendor would be the best fit for your workload unless you do some modeling based on the actual capabilities of the storage controllers, storage hardware, with your workload on them. In this case, we have an example of the IO response time curve for a series of workloads running on four different vendors. And as you can see, the vendor one uh, runs out of capacity, some kind of capacity, we don't know which from this graph, but runs out of resources around 20,000 IOPS and the response time increases significantly. Vendor two makes it to about 26, 27,000 IOPS and vendor three makes it to about 33, 34,000 IOPS before it, it has a steep inclination. Whereas vendor four makes it all the way to 44,000 IOPS. So depending on some other factors, vendor four would be the most likely vendor to choose for this workload. But you may not even know that unless you are able to go through an exercise where you can model your workload on different vendors. Another challenge with the configuration is just the complexity. There's so many options, so many models, so many choices that you have to make around the number of nodes or engines, directors, front-end adapters, all of those things add to the complexity of the system. So it's really important to be able to understand what the capabilities are of each of the configurations. In this example, we look at an IBM SVC and we model several different options for the number of IO groups or node pairs. So we look at two node pairs, three node pairs, and four node pairs, which is, in this case, the maximum configuration. Along the y-axis, we have the service time in milliseconds, and along the x-axis, we have the total IO rate in IOs per second. The green bar represents the two node pair, the blue bar represents the four node pair, and the red bar represents the three node pair. We can see that the maximum I.O. rate of a two node pair is 154,714, and that's when we start to see a significant increase in the response time. We also see that the maximum I.O. rate of three I.O. groups, or three node pairs, is 245,714. And we don't really hit the knee in the curve, at least in this example, with the four node pairs. If we have a workload that is greater than 245,000 IOPS per second, we're definitely going to need to look at four node pairs, at least for the front end workload. Another challenge when designing a system is trying to determine what kind of workload you will have at the end of the lease. Oftentimes when leases are considered, there's only the financial costs that are weighed. However, it's important to look at historical data for as long as you can. If you have three years of historical data, that's great. That will give you a good idea if there is any growth, and if there is growth, what is the growth, so that you can plan ahead for the future. SSDs and auto tiering are available on every platform at this point, and in most cases, they will help with performance, but it's not necessarily intuitive how much they will help or how much of each SSD category you need. So some platforms have SSD cache, which essentially acts as a read cache to store data for random read misses and then gives you a bigger read cache. And then some implementations don't have that, but they might have something like just additional space for SSDs. So there's always a question to know how much will help, how much do I need of each type, and how will the auto tiering take advantage of those things? And how will that relate to response times for my end users? So what I have here is a chart that shows three different models. And on the x-axis, I'm looking at the IO rate as the IO rate increases. On the y-axis, I'm looking at service time for the IOs on average. And I have three different models. So I've got the XIV four terabyte drives with no SSD cache on four SVC node pairs. And then I also have uh, the red is the XIV four terabyte drives with the SSD cache, same four node pairs. And then on the green, I have the XIV four terabyte with SSD cache with the flash 840 as well and easy tier running. And what I'm finding here is that while the system did not really get a lot of benefit 
benefit from the easy tier in this case, I did get significant benefit by having the SSD cache. You know, in terms of bang for the buck, this tells me that the best option is having the SSD cache. Something like this exercise is very important to do when you're considering SSDs in AutoTurn, and it does require special tools to be able to do that, and that's where IntelliMagic Direction and services come in. Another important aspect of planning a system's requirements is the disaster recovery planning. You need to know how much bandwidth you're going to need and sometimes you'll have historical data and if you do that's great. There's an example of the replication received throughput shown in this chart and what you need to know is what you've done in the past what is your historical trend what is the current requirement what is the distance between the sites and then what type of DR technologies are available and realistic for both your workload and your recovery time and recovery point objectives to summarize storage performance design with availability intelligence, you're going to need the configuration information, including the vendor, the make, the model, the host adapter configuration, the cache size, the backend disk configuration, as well as any auto tier or disaster recovery settings. You'll also need a workload that includes the IO rate, the read write transfer sizes, the cache read hits, the response times on the front end as well as the number of D stages to the backend disk drives. Additionally, you'll need to know what kind of performance you expect from the users. Lastly, once you have all of those things, you need to leverage some kind of solution that has a knowledge about what storage systems can do in order to anticipate and design the appropriate configuration. The first step in designing a system is to gather the workload information. So you're going to want to include the IO rate, the read write, transfer size, the read hit, the response time, the D stages. And we're going to talk about getting the right metrics and the right intervals and the right duration in this section. So when you're actually going to profile the workload, it's important that you have visibility into the right metrics. One of the things that is neat about it, using IntelliMagic Vision to gather this kind of workload information is we actually summarize some of the information that at the storage system level that is not really natively available via measurement. So we can take some of the lower level components and roll it up in meaningful ways at the higher level of the storage system, which is important when you're doing modeling. In this case, I'm showing a number of charts in a multi-chart view. I have the IO rate, the throughput, the response times for reads and writes, as well as the most active volumes, uh, cash flow conditions, read hits, and then some information about the backend drive rate and the backend response time for both reads and writes. This is all very important information. When you're going to do modeling, we need to understand all of these metrics. To be honest, they're not, in most tools, they're, they're just not available, but they're important in understanding the workload. When you're doing workload profiling, it's very important to select an interval that accurately represents your peak workloads. In this case, I have three hours of data with 30 minute intervals. During this three hour window, the peak 30 minute average is 1882 megabytes and it occurs at 7.30 a.m. Let's reprocess the data at 15 minute intervals what we find is that at 15 minute interval, the peak is also at 7.30 a.m. and it's roughly the same, 1,892 megabytes. What happens if we were to look at 5 minute interval data? Well that represents a significant difference between the 15 and the 30 minute intervals. At 5 minute intervals the peak is 2,450 megabytes per second which represents about a 25 percent difference than the other interval lengths. The other difference is the timing. At 5 minutes we see that the peak is really at 5.30 a.m. not at 7.30 a.m. It's very important to choose a workload interval that is granular enough to capture the peak workloads. If you're unable to get the granular workloads, then you should add a significant buffer to the evaluation to make sure that you assume there's a cushion in place for those peaks. Another important aspect of workload profiling is picking a sufficient duration or what I refer to as the right duration. That means that you want to make sure that you are collecting data that includes your peaks and valleys. In this example I have data from 3.30 to 4.30 for a single day so this is one hour's worth of data and the peak is around 8600 IOs per second. Is one hour of data enough? Well we would have to look at more to find out. In this case I'm looking at now the same controller for a 24 hour period 
and I see there's peaks well over 13,000. So obviously one hour isn't enough for this controller because the workload has a lot of variance. Is one day enough? One day may not be enough if you have significant variation in the workload throughout the week. This is the day that I used for the previous pictures, but the question is, did it include enough of the peaks and valleys to make it a representative peak workload? And the answer is obviously no, because I was looking at 1.4, 2015, and there were times later on, on 1.5 and 1.6, where the actual workload was significantly higher, almost double. If I would have done modeling with the peak workloads on 1.4, I would have made some really bad assumptions about the peak workloads. When you're incorporating storage performance into the solution process, you need to make sure that you gather the right requirements. The question is what kind of performance do you expect? But that actually can be broken down further into a number of other questions, such as what kind of performance have you had in the past? What are the existing expectations? How many tiers do you have and or need? So sometimes either because of how things were done in the past or what users expect to pay from a billing perspective, there's an expectation around tiers and there might be a concept of performance for each tier. So how much of each type of tier do you need capacity wise to support the workload that you have? Another question you might ask is how much faster is the new storage for each tier? So can the users expect more performance for less money? Will you be adding new features such as replication and what will you need to do to design the system in such a way that those new features don't add so much overhead that they reduce the performance. And what is the vendor willing to agree to in terms of performance SLOs or SLAs, which would mean penalties if they fail to meet them? And then how will they enforce the SLOs or SLAs? Do they have a proposed solution in place to take care of that? Is the solution going to cost more than it's worth? Does the solution work? Lastly, the how much capacity and workload will be added during the lease? So this is a planning question. Do you have an idea of your historical growth? Do you have any view into the business horizon to know how much new workload you can expect to come into the system? These are all important things to ask when creating your RFPs. I wanted to provide one example of a statement that we might see in an RFP and this is an example it says a sustained average disk response time across all primary storage that is at least 20 percent lower than the measured data from current production systems while performing asynchronous remote copy. So this is a fairly loaded statement but it is addressing the need to identify what your expectations are around disk storage response time on the primary and this assumes that you're in a situation with a replication environment. This is an asynchronous replication that you're expecting to be able to perform. And you're also expecting, because it's a new controller, that it's going to perform at least 20% better than the existing generation. These are the types of statements that you need to communicate to the vendors in your RFP. So to summarize the inclusion of performance in the design phase, it's really important to have some kind of solution that has built-in knowledge of the storage system capabilities. Otherwise, you won't know what to expect. And the vendors aren't always likely to tell you. The first thing that you want to do is to make sure that the vendors respond to the RFPs with your performance requirements, as stated in the previous slide. And then you want to compare the different RFPs based on the performance, the cost, and the features. Ideally, you would want to model and validate that each of the proposals will satisfy the requirements. And then you want to address any performance concerns prior to the build phase. Lastly, you'll select the vendor based on price, performance, and features. In this phase of the storage lifecycle management, we'll focus on the build activities. In this slide, I'm just going to summarize some of the benefits of using availability intelligence or the idea of incorporating knowledge about your storage hardware and the performance expectations into the build phase. The first thing that you want to make sure you do when you're building the system is to define service level objectives. And these are rarely used operationally because they're just too hard and too complicated to maintain and the vendor really doesn't want to enforce them because then you might complain or ask for some kind of discount or adjustment to the, the payment structure. What we suggest you do is to consider having an availability intelligence approach where you have automatic comparison 
of key performance and risk and indicators built into the solution and conduct service level audits before, during, and after the installation. The second area of the build phase that should be taken into account when doing availability intelligence is in making sure that you enable the operations with processes and documentation to ensure that you have the performance and capacity that you desire and require. The status quo is to use vendor tools that tend to be focused on reporting metrics, whereas the availability intelligence approach is going to leverage solution with built-in knowledge about the capabilities of your storage platforms and prevent SLO violations. Now, in the next couple slides, I'll just briefly go over some examples of how that might look during the build phase. During the build phase, it's important to operationalize the service level objectives that you agreed upon with the vendor during the RFP phase. You want to make sure that you configure your service level objectives for early warning for each application. In this example, I'm showing what's called a volume group dashboard or a collection of volumes associated with different applications. And we're showing the key performance indicators, response time, read response time, write response time, read hit percentage, fast write bypasses, and then the backend drive read response time when it's available. In this case, we can see very clearly that the prod db underscore db2 and prod db underscore oracle applications are having higher than expected response time. Another way to enable the operations team to monitor the service level objectives is to provide a solution that has built in knowledge about what each of the hardware models can do. In this case, I'm looking at the throughput for a storage controller, and I see the outline of the chart is red. I know that something is, is not quite right. It's got a rating. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but uh, what I am going to look at is the thresholds. So these are built-in thresholds. We have thresholds here, uh, as demonstrated to show you that the different levels. So there should be some consideration of how much data that can flow through the system on the front end, how much data can flow through each port. Uh, if there's FICON ports or fiber ports, they both need to have a setting here for how much data can flow through. And then we also need to consider how much data can throw across each of the host adapters or SVC nodes. What we want to do is we want to look at the configuration of the system, take into account each of the flow points and what each can handle and look at the actual configuration and, and then set thresholds that are appropriate for that. Now, the IntelliMagic Vision solution does this automatically for each controller that we support, but in theory you could do this with other solutions too. In this last phase of the storage management lifecycle, we'll discuss the things that should be done during the run phase. I'm just going to summarize the benefits of including availability intelligence in the run phase, and then I'm going to go through a few examples in more detail. The ultimate goal of these activities is to reduce the mean time to resolution and prevent predictable problems. And you do this by monitoring the applications and the service levels and the replication, identifying root cause, and monitoring imbalances in a regular proactive basis using a solution that takes into account your workload and the specific capabilities of your hardware. During the run phase, you're going to want to monitor your key applications and how their storage performance is doing. In this case, we're looking at the ProdDB Oracle, which we noticed in earlier dashboards had performance issues highlighted in the read response time and some of the other response time metrics. In this chart, I've simply drilled down to the volumes in question, and I can see there's a couple volumes, particularly volume 000039 and volume 000447 that are in bold, and those are the volumes that are having the worst response time. This is just one example of how you might monitor your key applications and ensure that they have the performance that the user is expecting and requiring. During the run phase, it's also important to monitor the SLOs of the ESX and other clusters. This is a chart that shows the SLOs for front end response time for a number of systems that are clustered together. Another important area during the run phase is to monitor proactively the replication activity and provide alerts when replication is exceeding your desired targets. 
Typically, this is done in a reactive manner when replication is having problems or when it is impacting the front-end response time. It's actually much better to have replication write response time monitored in a proactive way and set thresholds that are reasonable. This is an example of a, an asynchronous replication for a set of SVCs, and you can see that the response times are fairly high, and they're also the chart has been rated red. These kinds of thresholds should be set and should be set up for alert the user when the desired SLOs are exceeded. When you're managing a large storage infrastructure, it's not uncommon to have hosts that behave badly, HBAs that go bad, switch ports that, that go out, or front-end storage port saturation or back-end disk drive contention. It's important when you do have these situations to be able to drill down to root cause. In this case, we'll go through a misbehaving host that's causing high latency on some SVC adapters. What we see here is high read response time on the front end of the SVC between 2 a.m. and 12 p.m. on 429. When we look at the write response time, we also see elevated write response time during this interval. If we drill down to the node read response time, we see that node 4 and 5 are impacted the worst. These are the blue line, node 4, and the orange line, node 5. We also notice that on node 4, there's very, very high number of buffer credit shortages during the same period. This indicates that some host is holding on to buffer credits longer than we would want it to, or the SVC is having to hold on to the buffer credits longer than desired, and thus making the number of buffer credits available for that SVC node lower for everybody else's activity. If we drill down to the volumes on node 4, we see a very consistent pattern with most of the volumes on node 4, an extremely high read response time, approaching 200 milliseconds. If we drill down to the volumes host, we see that it's associated with host system 0203 and 0204. Looking at the host system 203's switch ports, we see that they're saturated. This relays one of the ports on one of the fabrics. The other port looks exactly like this on the other fabric. So they're both saturated at 100% during the entire period where we're having the performance issues. This is typically a called a slow drain device, and these are the types of symptoms you would see. So just to summarize, workload on host system 203 was saturating the host 4 gig per second ports from 2 a.m. to 12 p.m. daily, and it was leading to high response time for shared SVC ports and switch ISL ports. This is the classic slow drain device. It's basically able to send more requests than it can consume or process during that period. There's several possible solutions, and I guess it's the old adage, there's several ways to skin a cat. In this case, you can reduce, optimize, or rebalance the host workload across additional host ports. That will have the effect of increasing the workload on SVC, but removing the constraint on the host end so that it's able to, if you spread it across more ports or faster ports, you can have the host consume more and, and it shouldn't be holding the buffer credits as long. You can also ensure that the host has the most recent firmware multipathing drivers. Oftentimes there are updates to different HPA drivers and firmware that do improve the way they, they handle the buffer credits. If you read the release notes and you see something like buffer credit improvements, or performance improvement, that's often a good indication that they, that may be a helpful thing to do to upgrade or increase the firmware rev. The other thing you can do to control how much I.O. is actually going to the SVC at one point in time, you can actually reduce the HBAQ depth on the, the host in question. This has the effect of reducing the number of outstanding requests provided by the host, and it will reduce the number of buffer credits that it, it will be holding at any given point in time. And you can also update the host HBA from 4 gig to 8 gig if the host ports are saturated. So those are a few of the ways to approach it. I hope that was helpful. Another aspect to the storage lifecycle management run phase is detecting imbalances within the infrastructure. Within SVC I.O. groups, it's not uncommon to have imbalances within the I.O. groups, especially for short periods. However, when you're looking at longer periods, it's important that the average throughput is roughly the same across all of the I.O. groups. 
In this case, most of the I.O. groups are fairly well balanced. What I'm showing here is the average represented by the green dot, the standard deviation represented by the green rectangle, and the minimum and maximum values represented by the yellow rectangles. If I drill down to I.O. group 1, I do see there are some imbalances between node 6 and node 7 within that I.O. group. And when I drill down to the ports on node 6, I see fairly significant imbalances in the ports. Further drilling down into the volumes associated with node 6, I see that during the day, there's just a few volumes that form the primary workload. And when I look at the associated volumes, it looks like it's associated with the system 185 through 199, which is probably an ESX cluster. The names have been made generic to protect the uniqueness of the systems. The issue here is we have imbalanced workload in IO Group 1, leading to inefficient utilizations across the storage infrastructure. The reason for this is that the host workload is unevenly spread across the volumes, sometimes or the host is ignoring the preferred node path. What you can do to resolve this situation is twofold. You can upgrade your multipathing software on the host clusters to recognize the preferred pathing. That way you can manage the volume to node association or the preferred node for a particular volume from the SVC perspective, which is a non-disruptive change, which would allow you to modify the preferred path for some of the volumes in order to rebalance the overall workload and optimize the environment. In conclusion, the storage management lifecycle and availability intelligence are really designed to enable capacity management as defined by ITIL, which is the process responsible for ensuring that the capacity of IT services and IT infrastructure is able to deliver agreed service level targets in a cost-effective and timely manner. Each of these activities or phases in the storage management lifecycle can be enabled for capacity management with availability intelligence. In the design phase, you have to consider the workload that you're trying to support and design a solution for, as well as the configuration that you desire. You also need to understand the performance requirements, the right metrics, the right durations, the right intervals. And lastly, you need to put those requirements in the RFP so that the vendors that you're soliciting can provide you with reasonable feedback that includes the performance requirements. So those are just a few of the activities in the design phase. In the build phase, we're looking to enhance the capacity management capabilities within the storage management lifecycle by providing an SLO solution and enabling the run phase. During the run phase, the activities are focused on enforcing the SLOs as previously defined in the RFP. We are also looking at including proactive monitoring, optimization, rebalancing, and lastly, root cause. In conclusion, the only way to effectively enable storage management lifecycle and the capacity planning process as defined by ITIL is with availability intelligence. Thank you.